just to start, so like a lot of what I'll be sharing, all the materials, they're kind of disparately disorganized in various places, and I'll kind of share them as I go, but a lot of them you can find them on like my website when I'll show projects. Um, and also um, this thing, ML4A, I'm actually going gonna, gonna to introduce it in just a few minutes. Um, it's kind of coupled with the class, and I'll be using both creating a lot of materials for that, for this course and also using materials from there. So a lot of the code that I'll be using and things like that, um, you'll be able to find it there. Um, so I'll talk about that in just a minute. So like just to get some of this this kind of like admin policy stuff out of the way, um, you know, before jumping into the material, I just want to mention like a couple things and we've already kind of touched upon a lot of these themes. So, so I think we kind of know a little bit what to expect, but like, um, you know, so What's that sound? <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So, um, so in what with what I do, like with machine learning, I constantly find myself interacting with, you know, research scientists and people in academia who know this stuff way better than me, at least the scientific side of it, and which can be very intimidating. You know, like they they, they and there's this kind of culture of purism that you find in scientific circles. So, um, I just want to say that like here. We all, ha we all know different things from each other, and so this should be like, we should consider this like a very safe space. Like there's really nothing that you can ask that, that you should feel uncomfortable about because, um, you know, for all those things that I mentioned just now, uh, there's no assumptions made here about your level of like mathematical knowledge or computer science, and we'll be kind of like, um, you know, going through these things as we go. Um, at, the, at the same time, we may not necessarily really have the time to um, you know, this is not going to be a math class. It's not even really going to be a coding class. So, um, a lot of those things we're going to try to like think on our feet and figure out ways of like um, getting people to uh, feel comfortable with the tools. And also, um, so yeah, just feel like this is a very safe space. You can really like and, and feel free always to interrupt me. I want this to be very discussion oriented uh, as much as possible. Um, and along the same, so this is related and possibly kind of co conflicting. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm now recording my screen. And so um, this is kind of something that I've been in the habit of doing since my ITP course because I want people that don't necessarily have access to these kinds of, um, you know, these courses that, that we're in to be able to watch this stuff. There's a lot of interest from, from the outside in machine learning uh, in this context. And so I've been um, trying to make as much of these materials available as I go. And so, um, you know, with, with recording my screen as when I lecture, there's probably not too much concern about that. Um, and as far as discussion goes, I don't think any of you guys are going to be audible anyway right now. So I guess it doesn't even matter. But um, maybe that's something we can kind of like talk about again later today. Um, because like I don't want the uh, recording to, to inhibit people, um, you know, because um, so like, like I said before, and just to reiterate, like nothing uh, will go up, you know, without people's consent. And so, and, and really maybe none of it will go up actually. So we'll see uh, about that. Okay. So um, what will you get out of this course uh, and what you won't get? And that's, that's kind of maybe even more important. Um, this whole like dinner table theory, the, the idea is, um, you know, we're not going to learn how to be a research scientist. You know, people spend entire PhDs learning about this field. And so um, you're kind of like, my hope is that you understand the theory of machine learning and in the sort of broadest uh, possible way. So we'll be looking at like uh, actually every branch of machine learning at least a little bit. And so, um, and I kind of like this taking this broad approach because the field is very fast moving. And it's kind of in, in this context, in the sort of creative artistic context, it's very early stages. Um, and so, you know, rather than teach to the specific applications and the specific code sets that we have now, I want people to like understand how neural networks in particular, how they work, um, so that when new things are demonstrated, you have a, a sort of a way of understanding, you know, what, why, why they work or um, or being able to connect the dots between different kinds of applications. And that's really like, that's the core thing about this, this class. And um, we'll get a smorgasbord of applications and examples. I guess this is, that's a German word, right? Um, so, um, and... Um, <laughs> Roland says no. Oh, is that it? It's not? What is it? Where, where is that? I think it's, I, I just read it. I 
think it's English, right? It's more is it? Is it English, English word? Right? It's kind of like it's a like goofy old thing. It's like what? I I want to know what the etymology of smorgasbord is. <laughs> is it Swedish? Oh, it's a Swedish word. Okay. Wow. All right. Learn something new every every day. Bread and butter. Okay. <laughs> wow. Don't I don't I feel like an ass? You know, like <laughs> it sounded German. All right. Anyway. Um, and um, okay. So there's. Uh, and then the last thing is like a compass. So like what I mean by that is like after these four weeks, you'll know how to how to keep up with the field if you're so interested. Uh, maybe you know it's a, it's a rabbit hole. So I'm hoping that at least a few of you come out of it like wanting to do it as much as I do, like which is almost on a full time basis these days. And um, I'll give you a sense of like what the landscape is and what the resources available to you are. And so you should know how to proceed. Um, and Along those same lines, I should mention, you know, that like uh, what we won't get out of this course because the, because it's impractical. So this is not a scientific course, as I mentioned. We're not. We're gonna. We're, we are gonna look at math. We're gonna look at like computer science stuff to understand how neural networks work because it's necessary. But we won't really go to the lowest level of detail. So there are gonna be uh, neural networks are actually mathematically, believe it or not, are actually deceptively simple. And not, that's not to say that they're simple, but they're much more simple than like. You know, I look at a book of quantum physics and I don't understand any of the math. But with machine learning, it, it actually tends to be like mostly algebra and like sort of high school math. And there's like some calculus for certain topics, but um, we can mostly proceed without calculus. So, um, but, at the, but it's not going to be a scientific course. Um, it's also not a coding course. So we, we are going to be coding and we're going to be looking at code. Uh, but we're but we're not really gonna have time to do things like like I know some people here are probably total beginners to code or or at least uh, novices, and so um, and and we're not going to really have the time to like introduce core coding concepts like you know for loops or if statements, and um, to make matters even worse is that we're going to be looking at multiple different languages of code, and so the way we're going to deal with that is that when I show code <laughs> examples, I'm basically going to give like pre-baked sort of code snippets and I'll go through each section and show what those do rather than like re-implementing them or expecting you to re-implement them. They'll be kind of like isolated tools that can maybe plug into each other. It's a little bit more high level. So like think of it as like we'll get a, a smorgasbord of tools um, that do different things and can kind of plug into each other like Lego blocks, let's say. And, um, and for those of you who, who do want to dig in and maybe modify the code, um, you'll certainly know how to do that because, because I'll explain like what each section of the code does. So that's going to be our approach to code. We'll also be using some basically compiled tools. So for example, when, when Rebecca's here, we'll be using Weconator, which is, a, um, which is already a pre-built application that lets you do machine learning on your, on your computer without coding. Uh, which which is a really great way to, to get into it. And I, I'll also be, similarly, I, I'll have uh, tools and open frameworks that are already pre-built and you can use them for various purposes. So we'll, we'll, we're going to see a lot of that. We'll, we'll kind of figure that out exactly as we go. Um, projects. So in my, I, I just, I'll, exp I'll talk about this in just a minute, but I taught a course at ITP um, at, at NYU um, this past spring. And um, in the last week, we had student presentations, and you know we're also expecting to have like an exhibition, maybe of the style that we had in the computer vision course. And um, most people, uh, maybe let's say two thirds of the students, did you know art applications, so using processing or open frameworks, or you know some people did um, things in Python or whatever, um, different sort of art hacks. Um, but then another third, maybe of the of the course, did uh, more like. Um, like critical writing or presented a topic of interest that was interesting to them. And that uh, I want that to be like a total, that's also like, even though we'll probably focus more on the, the, the first one, because that's more what I'm familiar with, um, I really like encourage people to bring in, you know, whatever topics interest them, because we're not gonna, there's just so many dimensions to this field that um, I won't be able to, to, and I don't know all of them very well. so. Um, I'm hoping that people have like, you know, if you become interested in something that even if I mention for like one sentence, you know, you might get interested in that and maybe bring some of that in um, from the outside and we'll figure out how to incorporate that into the show because I guess like the shows are typically like installations and things like that, but 
Um, I, I hope that like people who want to do something like research a topic and write about it or present or talk about it, um, that's also going to be something that, that I think we can do um, in these four weeks. And then, um, so this notion of assignments, so actually, and Rachel and I talked about this, and we, we like, we sort of have different mindsets about this, so, <laughs> but I, I'm really, I'm actually really bad at, at giving assignments, um, and it's not because, it's partially because, um, you know, like, for me, I see it as, as a task upon me to inspire you to, to want to, like, find the thing, you know, be, Instead of assignments, I'll be giving a lot of suggestions, you know, and tons of them. And I'm hoping that people are sort of inspired to, to look into those and, and, and bring those in rather than saying, okay, do this, this, and that. And there is also less urgency to do so because we're meeting every day. So there's kind of like, you know, in the ITP course, I'd give some assignments because, you know, we'd be free for the next week and I want, you know, maybe someone to do something. But I will give some readings, including today. Um, which, which, which should be, um, you know, we can think of them as assignments, I guess. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions about policies and expectations, things like that? Any questions? Okay. If you have any questions, like, just interrupt me and just um, let me know. Okay, so, um, as I mentioned, I, I spoke uh, I, about this course that I did at ITP, which was called Machine Learning for Artists. It was a seven-week course um, that took place between March and May of this past year. And, um, and all the lectures are online. I'll, I'll show you those in a moment when I introduce ML4A. And this is kind of like roughly how it went. So basically, you know, we had these presentations at the end. So like I spoke almost the entire time during the lectures. And then like at the end, they just flip, flipped, right? Um, and I'm hoping to get something more like this uh, during, over the course of this class. So, you know, today I'll be talking a lot and, and probably this week more or less. And I think next week Rebecca will be will be kind of leading the charge with with Weconator stuff, and I'm hoping that like as we get more and more uh, into the course, you know, there's more and more participation from you guys, and and week three and week four are really kind of like I'm planning less and less like concrete material, and hoping to spend more time um, working on maybe like projects or practical things, um, and introducing tools as as we go, and um, I don't know how you know. I don't know how well we'll be able to do this, and this is kind of my goal. So, so help me, help me, kind of do, that. help me make make it work work out like this. <laughs> um, okay, <clears throat> there's a few like, um, and just just sticking to more admin stuff before getting into the material. I know this is the boring part, um, but there's like um, in terms of designing the material for this course, there's a lot of trade offs between different kind of goals that are competing with each other. And um, there's really no obvious answers, and, and doing one is necessarily sacrificing the other. Uh, and so we'll kind of have to figure out exactly where to find this balance. And, there, and it exists on two axes, as I can tell. One is like, do we focus more on theory, or do we focus more on, on applications? Um, in my ITP course, we actually focused predominantly on theory, um, and then um, rather than applications, which is actually kind of unusual for ITP, ITP is like, really wanting to do projects right away. And part of the reason why I do this is because I perceive this field, machine learning, as especially in the arts, as being in a very early stage, um, you know, kind of like maybe what computer vision was like, let's say 10 years ago, um, before it started being used in all these interactive installations. Um, and maybe I think also an analogy can be made with VR, like virtual reality, I, I suppose maybe AI is kind of like where VR was maybe two or three years ago when things like the Oculus Rift started coming out. Um, and AI is a very raw field and all of the applications and the tools are changing all the time. Um, it's, it's incredible how fast things are changing, the frameworks and the code bases. And things have a tendency to converge over a few years maybe into like some unified set of tools Like maybe we'll see something like open frameworks emerge um, in the future for AI, but, for, but for, the, for the time being, everything is sort of like scattered. Um, it's a very raw field. And so it's, I think we don't necessarily want to focus on the, the tools because then you may, you know, like everything changes next year. And what we'd rather have is like a, a foundation for how to keep up with the field over time. It's really a good time to get into it. Um, you know, like maybe you guys are hearing a lot about it in your circles, but for the most part, it's still kind of unknown um, in, the, in the general public. So 
Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we kind of like everyone feels like they understand this field, that they can, that they can even like look at the abstracts of research papers and, and feel like they know what they're talking about. And if, and if you do have that, then you're in a really good position to kind of, to kind of go forward. Um, learning coding is something that you, can, that you can do if you put the time into it. Um, learning machine learning is, is a little more confusing because it's because it's like hard to figure out where you know what to look at. There's so many like resources and they're written for different kinds of people, usually computer scientists. So um, I'm hoping that like this is a good opportunity to really try to give you guys a, a foundation. And then the other trade-off is between sort of fundamental uh, theory and, and or fundamental applications and, and creative applications. And I think we'll, we'll kind of mostly focus on these. Fundamental is like how to train your own neural, your own neural networks, um, how to like find data sets and, and tune them and things like that. And creative is more like, you know, on top of that. So how do you use a trained model to do something really cool and interesting? And um, the, you know, this, this course is really going to focus more on this. Um, but, but it's kind of necessary to understand some of this too because it's kind of the base layer. Um, so we'll be, we'll be talking about that as well. Um, any comments, comments, questions? I think it's really important, the theoretical part, because if you want to talk about the ethics, uh, you need to have some understanding. Yeah. You just play around mm -hmm. with the tools, which is fun, I have to admit. But uh, I think we're all here to learn a little bit more about the ethics, ethics of that as well. And I think that's why theoretical. Very important. Yeah, yeah. As and, much as the playing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And we will be talking about ethical topics as we go. Um, and I'll mention that in the when we talk about structure. Um, and that's true. Yeah, I think theory is very useful for that. I do feel also a bit of the second one, um, mm -hmm. the creativity and the fundamental. I feel mm -hmm. it's important to do both. So I kind of feel that if it's just the creative side, then you're slightly at risk of not understanding any of the back end stuff. You're just yeah. kind of, it's almost like using a filter on your iPhone. Exactly, yeah. Does, you know, and all those ones, the neural, you know, the neural learning, all the um, deep dream stuff, you just send off a picture and it comes back and, oh, wow, I'm not using machine learning. Yeah, it, exactly, yeah. If we, if we teach too much to the creative side, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be kind of become a technician at deep dream or something. So it's, it's good to know what's on the back end. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, but, yeah, it really it, it comes down, we'll have to find a balance. And, you know, we're, we have limited resources, limited time, and so we're not going to be able to do everything. <laughs> Um, or even most things. So, um, okay, there's a, a few more eccentricities that I should mention uh, about this topic, um, or and actually um, about the way that I, I like to teach things. So I I'm, I like to repeat a lot of things. So like when we talk about how neural networks work, I'll maybe do it first sort of fast, the next day a little more slowly, the next day even more slowly. And I like to do this because I feel like rep for me, like, you know, the first time I, I heard about it or I looked at it, I didn't understand at all. Um, the, and then the next day I, you know, looked at it again, I, I was like, okay, I understand it a little bit more. And then um, the third day I tried to actually make it and I kind of made it work. And then the next day it was trivial. Um, so like, this is kind of like the, um, the, the way that things tend to work for me and for a lot, a lot of the people that I've, that I've worked with. Um, so we'll be kind of like, I'll be, you know, if we, tomorrow we'll introduce neural networks and, and I expect that a lot of people may not, may not entirely understand everything about them at first, but, you know, through a process of repetition and looking at the same materials, looking at the same slides and maybe saying them in different words, um, it'll start to make sense. And I also like to do this sort of broad approach where I'll introduce like, you know, like what's it for, you know, kind of go end to end uh, at a very broad level and then kind of back up and, and look at each individual part. You know, you can kind of black box certain things. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, not understand everything about it, but proceed um, knowing at least what it does functionally. And um, in doing so, uh, I, I find it helps me because, you know, when I know like where things are going, it kind of helps when I go to fill in the gaps and and so there's going to be some repetition and, you know, expansion of the black boxes throughout the course of this class. Um, the other thing about this field, you know, is um, it's so fast moving. And um, to give you an example, um, if we had been doing this course last year, right around this time last year, I think actually July 1st, so, so like three days ago, one year ago, was when the code base for Deep Dream came out. Raise your hand if you've heard of Deep Dream. 
every almost everybody. Okay, so that's so um, you know if that had happened, we would have had to completely change the class in the middle of it, um, and that that could happen this time too. You know, it's a really fast moving field. It feels like things are th amazing. Things are happening every week or every month, and so you know we'll actually try to kind of stay on our feet and and maybe like. Uh, you know, if there's, I'm, I'm constantly monitoring current events and news and, and, and all this kind of stuff. And so I'll bring in some, um, some new things. Uh, and actually, like, we'll be, I'm going to mention this, this uh, article that Kate Crawford wrote. Or this is just a few days ago. It was a really good article in the New York Times uh, made by someone who, who does a lot of research into machine learning ethics. And um, that was just from a few days ago. So I'll, I'll be sharing that. And, um, yeah, we'll kind of, like, try you know, there's a we can only incorporate new things so so much. But um, yeah, if this were if I were teaching like let's say 19th century English literature, we wouldn't have this problem, right? So, um, but for machine learning, it's kind of like we wanna we wanna stay current. And so that's gonna be something that happens. Okay, um, ML for A. I mentioned this is um, this is kind of uh, something I'm working on, um, and it's gonna be coupled with this course. Uh, and I'm gonna just show you that right now. So um, some of you guys may have already seen this by now if you've been, if you've been following along. Uh, basically, like, I'm making this online resource about machine learning for artists that exists on this website, uh, mlforay.github.io. Um, as you can see, we're, uh, we've been delayed by many months, and that's because the scope of this thing keeps changing. Um, but what it is is it's a book about machine learning for artists, and and it's going to be kind of like it's going to be at least a few more months before this is any state of readiness. But uh, there are actually a lot of materials on it already that I will be using for this course, and I have plans to develop new materials for this course, which I will be incorporating into the book. And this will be eventually kind of a like a contrib contrib contributors uh, based project and I'm hoping that maybe some people may be interested in contributing to it there will be a few sort of like I'll show you a little bit about what exists on this website so there's um, you can go to the draft chapters here they're out of order right now and there's really only one that's like mostly done and it's the chapter on neural networks and I and um, you know it kind of will like and it, and it tries to, if every chapter will follow a similar arc, it, like, we'll start a little bit with, like, the history and maybe the cultural context of the, of the, of the topic that it's about, and then it will move into, like, more, like, math, you know, describing from the very beginning, like, how these things work, and then, um, right now, most of these are pictures, but a lot of these will, will also be interactive demos, uh, in JavaScript, so you can kind of click into it and play with it and, and see how neural networks work and things like that. Um, that right now that's not done, so that's something I'm working on concurrently with this course, and maybe I'll be kind of working on it in the afternoons uh, when we when we kind of have downtime. And um, so yeah, th this is something that it, to look out for. Um, this is also being translated into uh, into now almost ten languages, which is really awesome. I have, I have um, friends in various places who know various languages, and this is something maybe um, this is already in Chinese. Uh, we have a great group of. Um, um, in China, actually, like Rachel will know, of course, Paul, um, who was in, um, who was at Parsons and and uh, and started this uh, open frameworks teaching program called uh, Of Course, oh, Of Course, in in China. And I was there a few months ago, and we got some people who are really enthusiastic about this and, and translating to Chinese. It's now also being translated into Japanese, Korean, Spanish, Turkish, Russian, Arabic, uh, and maybe some others. Um, so that's French. something. French, yeah, French, uh, French, Hungarian. <laughs> Not to put anybody on the spot, but any, anyhow. Um, so that's just something, something else. And then the other part of this is like there's kind of two more sections. There's these guides, and this is kind of like mostly being spearheaded by uh, my collaborator Francis Tseng, who's who's out in New York, and maybe we'll have him here in August. I'm hoping. Um, and he's writing these. These are like practical tutorials on doing things in machine learning. So there will be like cookbooks. You know, IPython notebooks, Python code scripts. There will be some Wekinator examples here that I'm planning on writing. And um, some open framework stuff, and we'll have a big repository of code. And this is all sort of like being developed as we go. So um, not too much to share, but like um, at the moment, but, but it's something to look out for. Um, the demos I mentioned, and these are actually broken right now, so I'm not going to show them. Um, but the demos are going to be incorporated into the book. And then the whole code base is on GitHub. So like the entire website itself is hosted 
by GitHub, and the demos and guides are here, and I'm also going to make an open frameworks repository very soon. Um, and, um, and yeah, and we're on Twitter. <laughs> what are the uh, demos They're going to be all over the place. And, I've, and this is kind of like the state of machine learning. You know, there's like a lot of stuff in Python, and in Lua is this other language, which is kind of weird that a lot of people prefer. I, I don't know how, how much longer, because TensorFlow is emerging as a sort of like, um, front runner for deep learning stuff, um, and then yeah, we'll have some open framework stuff for more real time, like live stuff, and um, and Wikimator is also so yeah, it's a bit all over the place. Um, that's kind of the state of things right now. Um, things will change in the future, but but that's how how it is right now. Uh, and this is kind of how it's structured, and I've kind of mentioned this a little bit. Okay, so I um, I taught this course at ITP, and you're looking at it. Um, Basically, it was a seven-week course and um, six weeks of lectures and one week of presentations. And this is it, 60 times fast. <laughs> and um, this is, um, you know, when, we, when, when I taught this course, it was, it was basically like just taking everything that I uh, have compiled over the last six to 12 months um, in this field of machine learning and condensing it into 12 hours. And this course is going to be kind of similar, but there's a big... Difference in that this course was like once a week for three hours, and then this, this course is like every day for three hours for four weeks. So we have less time on our own and more time, but way more time together. Um, and so we can kind of spread things out. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see how things go. So the, the structure will necessarily change. However, um, I mean, I'm showing you this because uh, these classes are actually all online. Uh, if you go to classes here, and this will overlap significantly with a lot of the material will overlap with this course. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in like more like just like lectures, um, then, then this class might be oriented towards. This is all available online. These are all like three hour uh, videos. You can download them and watch them offline. Um, so like for example, the recurrent neural networks is here and they're broken out into segments also. So you can click into each segment, um, you know, talk about image captioning or something and here, you know, my lovely voice. You can um, also do, and that, anyway, uh, <laughs> and all the notes are also coupled with it. So that's just a resource that you guys should be aware of. Um, and, I, and also, like, this is, and then I taught an ITP camp session, and um, who was working at ITP camp? Yeah, yeah, yeah Roland was with me, okay. Um, so this was, um, this is, this was basically, this class condensed the three hours. So if you want the, like, three hour, you know, rush through, um, you can you can get that here. Um, so all of those are available to you, and, and you know I don't even know if you really have time during this course because we're here together all the time. So, um, but it's something that to be aware of at least anyhow. Um, okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the syllabus. And again, this is like a work in progress, and we'll kind of like I modified the syllabus for the XP course as we went because it's kind of hard to anticipate, you know. And, and I'm trying I had. I have just a ton of slides and a ton of materials, and I'll try to read the class and see like what people are gravitating towards. Uh, maybe later, maybe like this afternoon, we can we can do a roundtable and talk about what people's like uh, like more specifically, um, you know, what people's skill sets are, or what they're hoping to invest, like what area they're hoping to investigate more of. Um, that'll be probably very valuable. But but in terms of like before I met all of you guys, this is kind of how I construed the the class and. Um, this week we're going to introduce neural networks and convolutional neural networks, and you know we'll 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 talk about what those are and everything, and talk about what they do. Um, convolutional neural networks are really the core of many of the deep learning applications that we'll be looking at, and um, and they're really just kind of like in the, like so much of the so much of the progress that we've seen in this field has been uh, a result of, of these and they're really good at processing images and processing sort of spatial data and things like that and you know we'll see more about what that means exactly but the goal of this week is to understand how convolutional neural networks work and they're really like the wellspring of every of all of these applications so deep dream and style transfer and um, you know we'll look at some some other applications that deal more with text a lot of them actually have to do uh, with convolutional neural networks, and if you really understand how those work, the other ones like kind of they're like dominoes. You know, they, it becomes you know style transfer seems like such a magic trick, 
But really the core of it is just understanding convolutional neural networks. And so that's the goal of this week. Um, next week will be much more applied. We'll have Rebecca Fiebrink here. And Rebecca has been working on um, Weckinator, which is this application which uh, lets you do machine learning. Like It basically takes care of most of the like the nitty-gritty implementation of machine learning, getting a data set and training it and things like that. And you can kind of focus on hooking up the app, your favorite applications, you know, if you're a musician. Um, Weckinator, we'll see more of this in more detail later, but Weckinator basically communicates with other applications over open sound control, which is this, uh, like, um, a format for passing data between applications. And we'll see how to use that. Um, if you're not familiar with it, don't worry. We're going to introduce that all from, from scratch. Uh, but what, what I mean to say is Weckinator really makes it easy to like, if you already have your favorite software that makes media, you know, if you use Processing or if you use Ableton Live or if you use, you know, uh, Max MSP, there will be ways of controlling those applications with machine learning using Weckinator and a handful of other tools that I'll be showing you. Um, and Rebecca will be, will, will be leading that. Um, she's been working on Weckinator since I think 2009, 2010, which is, you know, years before... Uh, deep dream so like a lot of this sort of like um, machine learning for artists and musicians um, has been uh, you know go, goes back a lot farther than than uh, than what we've heard in the last couple of years and um, yeah working there's a really great application Does, doesn't get nearly enough credit for it in my opinion so um, it will be great to have her here um, and then week three will be you know back to I guess mo mostly like deep deep learning which I mentioned and um, we'll be looking at more, like, this is probably the week that, that I'll introduce, like, at a more, um, like, rigorous level of, of what Deep Dream and Style Transfer are. Um, we'll probably do some of that this week also, but maybe at this sort of high level of abstraction. And then again, you know, in my, in that sort of repetition and expansion, we'll come back to it in week three and look at it again. And um, that's, that's all the thing. And mostly those are the things that really got, I think, got everyone's attention last year and are responsible for this field kind of in a, in a wider sense, gaining a lot more prominence. And so that will be week three. And week four will be like a handful of special topics, um, some fun things. I want to introduce like reinforcement learning and, and game AI because everyone, uh, that was my favorite lecture actually of the ISP course was about like um, um, teaching computers to win uh, Atari games. And we'll talk about um, the recent victory of um, a, a computer over the top human player at Go. Um, and um, it's kind of a nice little coda to a lot of the theoretical material because it uses a lot of the things. And um, every, and it was, yeah, it's like a, just an interesting topic in general to pursue, um, you know, autonomous agents and so on. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, and we'll and make believe, you know, so we'll be, we'll be working on um, applications and kind of like trying to, uh, and, and yeah, week three and week four will probably, I'm hoping, is sort of less, less and less, less lecture and more of these, you know, uh, maybe spend time introducing a certain tool. You know, I might, I can imagine a format where we um, have like, let's say, a half hour where I'll introduce how to uh, perform a particular operation that might be useful for a lot of people. And then, you know, we can practice it after that and we can kind of like keep a disjointed format. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that will work. That's something that we can kind of figure out together. And um, yeah, as Rachel mentioned, we'll have Samim here, and, and Samim is really active. Uh, and he, he's here in, Ber in Berlin. And um, for those of you who don't know him, he's really active in sort of promoting creative uses of, of AI. Um, I first um, met him online, actually, because he, st he started this, um, this website called Gitkive, which, was, uh, which is a, um, like a website which combines research papers with their associated implementations. And it kind of makes a nice little environment for like, okay, how do you go from research to implementation if you're interested in this field? Um, and he's been he's been pretty active in that for for you know most of this whole time. Um, Memo Memo will also be here. Um, Memo, I've also I've actually never met Memo uh, in person, but I've known him for years because uh, through the Open Frameworks community. Um, and so I'm looking forward to him being here. He's also doing a lot of AI stuff, and I think he's at Goldsmiths now, isn't? Is that right? Yeah. Um, and uh, maybe a handful of more of guests. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I've become acquainted with Tactical Tech, and they actually have a few really interesting machine learning projects that they maybe could talk about. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can maybe get a few more guests. Um, 
and uh, maybe talk about neuroscience. I don't know. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of interesting angles that we can that we can kind of make up as we go. Uh, man, there's a lot more admin stuff than I thought. What time is it? Good God. Okay. <laughs> All right. So like. Um, like I said, like this is sort of something we'll figure out as we go. And this is maybe I had this. I don't know if things will end up working this way, but I kind of thought it'd be interesting to maybe like let's say of each week, the first day is going to be kind of a theoretical, like basically lecture, talk about some the theory, the broad, you know, high level of abstraction, and maybe the, uh, introduce like one particular critical issue. I have like kind of a list of these things that we can that we can discuss. And then days two to four are like, you know, we'll go back into what we looked at days in day one and talk about each component in a more long form way um, and have discussions and things like that. And I don't know, maybe this will all end up being kind of a mishmash over the four days. I, I don't know yet. Um, we'll, we'll, cause yeah, everything is sort of evolving as we go. Uh, but this is just, you know, just to, I'm just putting you inside my head right now to see like, you know, where, <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, we don't have to stay inside my head. You know, well, I, I would also just add, I guess, that essentially the idea is that this school is supposed to be, this class is supposed to be for you specifically. Like if you, if there's something, like if you know, like you start to hate Gene for whatever reason, I think it's not going to happen, but like for, you know, it's like that we can like all talk about it. And so like, you know, feel like they're like it's going too fast or it's going too slow or like you wish you would have gone back to another topic or something like this or like. I mean, because also this is a way for him to improve, like, it's kind of like your second iteration and, like, trying to improve also, like, how to organize the class. So definitely feel free to, you know, to give feedback. Yeah, exactly. And, and feel free to, like, talk to me. I'm, I'm super open about this stuff. I want to hear how you, what your feedback is. You can also email me. Um, all those things are, like... You know, all that is very valuable for me because, like, part of the goal for ML4A is to be useful to other people, and it's not always obvious how to do that. So, um, feel free, please, to give me some feedback as we go, or, or to give suggestions, like, you know, how should we structure, or maybe there's some particular topic that you want to talk more about. Um, obviously, we won't be able to. There's 20 of us, four weeks. It, it's impossible to to do everything that everyone wants, um, but hopefully, we can find some some particular balance that optimizes our, our collective happiness, let's say. Gene, <laughs> um, can I add oh, you to, yeah? the, to the help channel on Slack? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm not aware of the whole Slack. Thing, so yeah, put, put me on the Slack. Um, and, and actually, yeah, I got the hackpad. Uh, Why would you be coding on some stuff? Do you think we should all do it? Or yeah, that's uh, it's it's kind of like it's kind of up to you. Like a lot, I, I definitely like recommend doing them as yeah, as we go. Um, or I mean, a lot of it is also recorded, so maybe it helps to to watch it and then you can go back and 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 a lot of it will just be available anyway. So maybe it makes more. Yeah, it's hard to say. It, it it's it's kind of like since it's recorded, it really like it, it's however you feel. So some people like to to watch and then and then do it later. Other people really like to be doing it at the same time, so I don't have a particular preference. I think you know, um, everyone's kind of different in, in how they approach that. I think that's what's like the power of our pieces. It's not what's in midnight. I was just wondering, like, do we have access to a server? Yeah. So so later when um, so for most of the for most of what we do in the first two weeks, that won't be an issue because we'll be looking at uh, things that will run fine on pretty much anyone's computer. Um, is is how many people are not on Max? I see one. Is that a PC, right? Okay, so there's two people. Okay, uh, and you're running Windows. You guys are on Windows. Okay, so that that's fine. I I have a Mac, and so a lot of my stuff is not set up for Win for Windows. But we can deal with that uh, individually. Um, it it should work on Windows. When we get into the deep learning stuff, um, some sometimes like that may become an issue. Uh, but but I'll actually be showing it um, uh, from a. Um, like using a, a an online cloud service that that and we, I actually have a whole bunch of credit from ITP that I'm just going to give to you guys, <laughs> and um, and we'll be able to to kind of piggyback on that to at least introduce it and then you know if you want to proceed with doing things like style transfer deep dream, um, a lot of that stuff can be done on on you know on a MacBook or a Windows computer. Um, some of it you may want to want to take offline, and I'll show you how to do that. Yeah, it takes a lot of memory, and um, 
And so, and that's, yeah, that's kind of one of those things that there's really no easy way around. Um, but it's getting better, actually. Uh, that's not, it's, it's way better now than it was six months ago. So, um, and in six months, it'll be even better. So, um, okay, so like, this is kind of, okay, so we're done with the admin. So let's get into like fun okay, stuff. Uh, Gene, did you yeah? say your email? Oh, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, kogan.gene at gmail.com. It's also on my website, uh, and, you know, Rachel has it. Or just, you know, ask me later. What's the best way to switch to the Slack and Slack? Slack, yeah. I mean, it, it, are you, if you guys are super active on Slack, I'll check it all the time. Um, for me, that's like I'm, I'm checking uh, my email or, you know, if you want to reach out to me individually, like you can – all those Slack's things are fine. Personal private messages too. It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, if you write, um, like, at Gene, you'll get a notification. Um, yeah. And if, and if, but then also, if you write something, then maybe your neighbor can help you, too. Yeah. That's the nice thing about it. If you ask yeah, yeah, I think, I think Slack might be nice, actually. So I would, I would suppose that maybe that would be a good, we can make that, you know, let's say, like, if you, if, yeah, let, let's put it in Slack, actually. I think that'll, that'll help keep it separate from all my other email, which is, you know, obviously, I'm sure everyone has the same problem. Um, so yeah, Slack is Slack is great. Um, okay, so in terms of well, okay, so we sort of did this, but maybe what I'm gonna do with like what I wanted to do with this whole introductions was to to learn more about you guys. But maybe we can do that after lunch, like and talk, go like a sort of round table and hear like what people do, why they're interested in uh, in machine learning, and why they want to apply it to their craft. Um, and um, so let's let's leave that for after lunch. Let's say. And uh, what I'll do now is I'll, I'll introduce some of the field at large, like at a very, very high level, like what is this machine learning business? Um, and, um, and then this might also, we might leave for after lunch is like a bunch of, I'll show like a big survey of uh, a lot of recent works uh, that have been made at machine learning. Um, Yu Meng mentioned Alt-AI, which was a conference um, that I helped to organize just, uh, just a month ago or a month and a half ago at SFPC. And um, I'll show a bunch of works from that, um, and that will maybe like start to kickstart this. You know, what what is going on in this field? Like, what are people doing with it? Uh, and um, and I'll show you a bunch of uh, you know a bunch of different things that have been demonstrated recently. And then tomorrow we'll get into like neural networks, you know, more formally, which are the dominant algorithm or class of algorithms that we'll be using in this class. And um, and both today and, and even tomorrow when we talk about neural networks, which is getting, you know, to be more technical, most of it is still going to be, like, pretty, like, fun and high level and entertaining. We're going to see a lot of pretty pictures and things like that. So um, I, think you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, any questions? Okay. So um, what's my next slide? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I had this sort of about me. Maybe I should, should I leave this for later? Or a few of you saw this. Um, I was gonna. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll do this now. I'll do this now, and this is about me basically, and then, um, and then I'll talk about um, I'll talk about the field, and I have a video clip to show and things like that. So it should be fun. Um, okay. So and a, a few for those of you who were at the computer vision class and saw saw me last week. This is a bit repetition for you guys, so I apologize. But um, but hopefully it's fun anyway. Um, okay, does anyone recognize the, I know, I know Lauren does, yeah. Anyone else recognize any of these two? Oh, of course, yeah. Um, okay, so this is Columbia, Columbia University in New York. This is where I went to college, and, I, and I've li been living in New York ever since. Um, and um, this is mostly what it looks like. So it's, it's you know, statues, and, and like the thinking man statue is there, and like these copper top buildings, and you know, it's really prestigious and whatever. But if you go um, to 125th Street, on the north side of campus, maybe you'll come upon this building, and I know Lauren's been there. Cynthia, have you been here? I'm not. Really okay. Well, if you get a chance to go, it's it's really a great place. Um, what this is is Prentice Hall, pretty ugly looking building because it's probably the most neglected building on campus, and I think they're going to change that soon because they like when I first came to Columbia, this is on 125th Street, and it's across. It was across from like a gas station. And there was like, you know, there's like nothing there. And now there's this big, Columbia's building this big like science center and medical campus. And so I suspect they're going to renovate it, as they say. And uh, which will be unfortunate because this building has, uh, this it has a very separate culture from the rest of Columbia. 
Uh, it's a lot more scrappy. It's like it feels a, a little bit cut off from the rest, and and it's kind of an old building. Like if you go to the like if you've ever been in a men's <laughs> restroom there, it has those like those really old school urinals. You know the ones that like the big bowls, the like spaceships that kind of come out from the wall. Like you know that famous piece by Marcel Duchamp, like the ready made. Those that's what that's what the urinals look like at at this building, and so um, and. Um, this building is really cool because it has an amazing history. So this is where they built the uh, world's first, this is the very first one in the world, the world's first computer programmable electronic music synthesizer. And it looks like this. And it's still there. In fact, and I, I mentioned I was going to show this. Um, yeah. This is what it looks like today. And um, this is Brad Garten, Terry Pender, and Douglas Arpedo. And Douglas actually just announced he's leaving, which is very sad. Um, he's been there for about 15 years. And they still play this thing sometimes, um, and it's pretty dusty, and it kind of works. Like, it's got, like, you know, cathode ray tubes inside of it that are falling apart, and it still makes sound. You can make all this sound in, like, a, a, in an app that's probably, like, less than one megabyte uh, that you could download on your phone by now. So, um, but at the time, it was really novel. Like, no one had made, you know, in electronic, people had been making electronic music for maybe a little while at that point, but not that you could program with a computer. And this was the first time they'd done that. This is 1957, I think. And this is the composer Milton Babbitt, who is um, you know, one of the first composers to experiment with this, with this kind of uh, technology. And, and lots of composers who are you know, very famous kind of came through those walls. Um, John Cage was there and Pauline Oliveros. And, and she was actually at Columbia for, I think, a good 20 or 30 years. And, uh, and um, who else? Like Pierre Pierre Schaefer, I think, was there, and like a handful of others. Um, Zanakis um, doing a lot of his chance music and stuff like that. Um, and so it's really interesting. They have this here. They built it. And it was really like the leading institution for this kind of work for a really long time. And um, when I got there, though, um, I got there in, um, in basically like 2005, 2006. I started hanging out there. And at the time, um, there was a group of graduate students there that were working on this program called Meepsoft. And uh, Meepsoft, which is not to be confused with a certain other company, which, which basically stole Meepsoft's logo. I don't know if you can tell what company I'm referring to. But, uh, Meepsoft is this really cool application for, um, what it does is it, it analyzes audio, and then it rearranges the chunks of audio, like the pieces, into, um, uh, it rearranges them according to like some compositional criteria, and um, and it makes really funny sounding music. And I'm going to show you it. Actually, I'm going to do a quick demo of Meepsoft uh, because Meepsoft is just so amazing. And this is really like for me, this is a big like uh, I'll I'll tell you why I'm showing this because it really like for me kind of got me started in this whole path. Um, so first of all. Uh, here we like, the first thing you do is you kind of specify some piece of music that you want to rearrange. And um, who's talking? Detention! <laughs> Detention, all of you. Okay, so... Um, the audio, so let's, let's go back to this. Um, the, um, the audio I'm going to use, everyone knows this song. I see a little silhouette of a man. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the bandango? Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo. Does anyone not know this song? Everyone knows it good. So far. It's a uh, Queen, Bohemian Rhapsody, and that's like the middle section. Um, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze it. We're going to split it into chunks. It's going to identify like audio events. And then what we're going to do is we're going to extract features. And this is kind of like, this is one of the principal things about machine learning. And we'll be talking about what this means, like features and feature extraction more carefully in, in future lectures. But... Um, what, the, what features are is like MFCCs, pitch, don't worry about those. Those are like sort of audio features. They describe the, the chunks of audio. So like, you know, what are the dominant pitches? Uh, what are the dominant sort of frequencies and, and, you know, dynamics of the audio? 
And um, then using that as our data, as our feature vector, we can rearrange all of the chunks of audio in some way. And we do that in this tab. And what we're going to do is a nearest neighbor sort. So what it's going to do is take all those, those, you know, those things that we were hearing and put them, rearrange them in such a way that like similar ones are next to each other. Right? So, uh, and so as you can see in this cutting edge interface, the go button is located right here. And, and my favorite part about this is when you click go and it starts to do the analysis, it starts flashing random colors at you. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, these, uh, these are all different, like there are different ways of rearranging the audio. So like so there's the uh, Hungarian dance videos a whole different source algorithms. What's that? The... They did a whole Hungarian dance and like they showed all the different kinds of source algorithms by doing different dances. Who, who did? On YouTube. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh yeah, you'll have to show me that. I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Anyhow, it's done, so we can look at it. And um, we launch the visualizer and here it is. And all of the chunks have been rearranged, and we're gonna listen to what it sounds like when, when we put similar sounds next to each other. Uh, I think you get the idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's Meepsoft. And for me, like, the whole, you know, I mentioned how the whole flashing colors thing is going on. And for me, like, that was really stuck with me because, like, you, know, you might ask, like, why would they do that? And, the, and then the, not for any reason. It was, like, just to make the thing kind of funny and approachable. And remember, I was, like, you know, I said I was, like, 19, 20 years old. I didn't know how to program at all. I didn't know anything about audio. But they made the thing like very approachable and very funny, and that and I've always like wanted to make that part of what I do, um, because you know I couldn't contribute anything to their project, so I just s sat in the back and like asked questions and things like that, so on. Um, so that was kind of like what got me started, and, I, and then a few years later I began to get interested in this field that they were working on, which is called music information retrieval, which is basically uh, applying machine learning to audio. So things like, can you take a piece of audio and, and uh, have a computer identify what genre it, it belongs to? Or uh, identify whether it's a cover song or, or tell you what the key of it is. You know, it's like things that aren't necessarily written with the metadata in the audio, but things that you can maybe extract. And, um, and that was my start to machine learning and applied machine learning in general. And I was making plots like this where you can do things like analyze Last.fm, uh, which is this internet radio station that you can tag music. You know, like this is sad music, this is emotional music, energetic music. And if you analyze how much these tag words co-occur, you can cluster them and see how different words are related to each other. So this is kind of like, and this was for me, like getting into this like sort of hive mind um, about machine learning. Like, you know, you can really use it to like, do, you know, discover things about ourselves in mass. You know, like, what, are, what, are, what does machine learning reveal about us, you know, when we put all this data online and in a structured form? And that led to a project called Color of Words, and this is one of my first, like, sort of, like, artistic hacks of machine learning, and I, this is when I really began to discover that I really was not cut out for research science, because every time I would learn about some new machine learning algorithm, like a self-organizing map, I would uh, immediately apply it to something that had nothing to do with what my job was, which was at the time music information retrieval. And um, this is a project where I learned about this thing called a self-organizing map. And what a self-organizing map does is it analyzes a distribution of data and then it reorganizes it in 2D so that similar points appear next to each other. So for example, you can analyze colors and then put you know, similar colors next to each other and cluster them. So I did this project where self-organizing maps are like basically obsolete now, <laughs> so don't worry about them, we're not actually going to cover them in this course. 
Um, we're going to cover something called TSNI, which is related, but, but is actually like 10 times better. And um, I was producing plots like this. So this would be like, I would take a, I would do a Google image search on the word winter. And it would download the first, you know, couple hundred images. And then it would analyze the color distribution of those images and show you the dominant colors that appear in those images relative to other pictures. And so we're getting at this like idea of like what, what color do people perceive associated with these words? So winter, spring, summer, fall should kind of make sense, right? You know, rainforest is a sort of deep green. Deserts are brown. There's a series of, of uh, holidays. So Valentine's Day is sort of all pink and then St. Patrick's Day is green. These are a whole bunch of like different fruits, tomatoes, grapes, broccoli, um, day and night. Is that every individual color in each image or an average color for each image? It, it's, it's, a, it's not the, like the pixels themselves, but it's, a, it's analyzed the distribution, like a probabilistic distribution. It first would find the probabilistic distribution of these colors and then, and then organize them spatially. So if that doesn't make sense, like we'll, we'll be doing things like this more slowly later. Uh, but just to give you a sense of like what kinds of things you could be making with these kinds of algorithms. Um, Democrats and Republicans look exactly the same, right? So people usually appreciate that, yeah. Um, oops, okay. So around this time I discovered these two things, processing open frameworks, everyone's heard of that by now. Um, and I started working um, in more of like things associated with you know, new media art. So I started doing like interactive installations. Um, I've mentioned some of these to you guys. So like I got really into projection mapping and like computer vision and doing a lot of things like uh, I, I developed this toolkit um, which, which I've used for a number of years and has been used in uh, a number of people that I'm using also. Like it's been developed by other people. Um, called Connect Projector Toolkit. It's like, uh, it allows you to take a connect and the projector and calibrate them together so that you can track a person's body and project onto them. So the person you're looking at here is, his name is Colin Self. He's actually here in Berlin right now. Or he's on tour right now. But he's a good friend of mine. And we did a residency together uh, with another collaborator of ours with the support Chung. And we did this thing called Opera Toolkit. This was uh, last year, I guess, at, uh, at iBeam. And we developed a whole bunch of like tools like this for performance artists. And uh, I also um, I mentioned this earlier to you know, like, this project called uh, like Eco Packer. It's kind of like where we built this temporary hut in the woods, and we put a bunch of projectors in it and made like a temporary performance space. So it's kind of like new media stuff, uh, projection mapping on a roving robot arm. These are all works that are on the web, so we're not going to really talk about them because they're not relevant. This is kind of like, explains maybe like, for, for me, like I approached this from, initially from this sort of machine learning mindset, um, and now I've been doubling back to the more recently trying to apply it to. Uh, okay, so that gets into, let's just see how we're doing on time. Uh, one o'clock, um, let me quickly look at what I have. So it's one o'clock, so we probably want to do lunch soon. How do you feel about like, one 30? Would that be okay? People feel good about another half hour? And then we'll... Then. Time, time. Yeah, uh, let me just see how much I expect. This is like hype stuff. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, I feel like we can maybe just... Let's see, like, I think, yeah, okay. I think this will take like maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then after lunch, we can talk, I'm gonna show a whole bunch of artworks. And that will be really just like tons of things that people have made that are really awesome. Um, and then we'll also do introductions. Does that make sense? Is that a good, good calendar? Okay. So, um, so let's, let, let me make a toss-up question. Like, what is machine learning? Uh, you know, we've been talking about machine learning and we haven't really like properly defined it. And it's not to say that it necessarily has a definition. Um, you'll hear it referred to in various ways. But I'm curious, like, you know, like if, if I ask you, if someone asked you, came up to you who knows nothing about machine learning, say your parents, um, <laughs> and said, you know, what is machine learning? Uh, what would you say to them? Does anyone want to volunteer an answer? What's machine learning? So, so much bravery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would what? say, like, I mean, 
I mean, to my parents, I would say it's like the type of artificial intelligence that makes like self-driving cars possible, and then maybe they did it that. But I guess my understanding is that they use more like statistical methods mm -hmm. as opposed to other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a good good one. Any else? Yeah. My understanding is it's like a program that like will get better the more that it does. Mm-hmm. That's also true. Anybody else? Um, if it's a traditional program, you really have to exactly tell what you have to do, not that the entire list and kind of list that makes it possible to make estimations. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so all of you are right. Um, this is this is the interesting thing. It's that like machine learning, and all of these like different words, they have not necessarily any like precise meanings. And 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 if you want to be really cynical about it, it's kind of more like branding terms because, you know, like machine learning refers to a particular set of algorithms that actually pre-existed the field of machine learning itself. Machine learning as a term came came later. And uh, actually, my old uh, uh, advisor at, at Columbia, and I was in the applied math department, his name is Chris Wiggins, he said, um, I, I like this quote, he said, machine learning is applied computational statistics. And that's kind of because there was this field called computational statistics where people were applying statistical models to problems of data inference and doing it with large data sets using computers. And that was what people were doing before anyone came up with this term machine learning before. And now we have this new term that has come along in the last few years called deep learning. And, and raise your hand if you've heard deep learning. Yeah, so, uh, and you know, what, what is deep learning? Well, that's just like another branch of machine learning, which is particularly concerned with like, and it does have a sort of specific definition. When we get into neural networks and deep learning, I'll, I'll describe what that is exactly. But um, mostly these are all sort of branding terms and they loosely apply to different things. In maybe the most like um, uh, like all um, encompassing way possible, machine learning is like you know as as Lisa said, it's, uh, um, it's artificial intelligence which uh, uses a lot uses a lot of like um, statistical methods and and um, uh, to you know get better at particular tasks and and it's and you might also from a more philosophical standpoint, it's like machines exhibiting what we would perceive in humans as to be learning. So what do we think of as learning? It's like, you know, you, I don't know, we all know what learning means, right? You, you, you know, are exposed to something and you kind of learn what that is. It's, it's hard to define without using the word itself, right? So it's one of these things that we all sort of have an intuition for. And we're going to see a lot of algorithms that seem to exhibit this. You know, they, they are necessarily like at first kind of stupid and then they learn like how to do things and they get better with when they get more examples, as Cynthia said. Um, and um, this is a, and what we're looking at actually, this is um, an add-on I made called OFX Learn, and this was the first interaction I had with Open Frameworks actually. Um, this, was, this was basically an implementation of pre-deep learning, like simple neural networks and, and, and what's called support vector machines, don't worry about the terminology, we'll, we'll go into all of that, um, which do things like uh, classify data. So like if data has categories, uh, how do we predict what an unknown data point, what category it belongs to, or maybe instead of categories, we have like a particular value we're trying to predict, and that's called regression. And people have probably heard this, and if you've taken math or statistics, statistics courses um, before, and that's kind of like, those are the sort of the core tasks of what's called supervised machine learning, which is a branch of machine learning which is concerned with uh, associating sort of data with other kinds of data and this maybe sounds really general we'll see what that what that means more specifically as we get into it um, and um, we'll kind of general regression? regression is is um, trying to predict a uh, like like suppose you have like a, an equation like a polynomial equation y equals a x squared plus b x plus c right something like this and it's trying to figure out well, what are A, B, and C such that this the, the, that that function matches a particular distribution of data. So say you get all of these points, you know, and these points in X, Y space or something, and you want to be able to like fit a line through them because it would be useful to understand what the like what is the underlying function which explains this data. 
So uh, regression analysis is, is, is something that you would do. And this pre-exists. Regression is a really, really old, old uh, method. It way pre-exists by, by decades. Um, and depending on how you look at it, maybe even centuries of what, what we think of as machine learning. Uh, machine learning is basically this on a huge, massive scale using computers. Um, and um, clustering, this looks really different from this, but really it's kind of the same, except, except instead of a continuous value, we have categories, labels. So will it rain or will it not rain? You know, maybe we want to create a weather prediction system. And we want to decide, you know, what, given a bunch of data about the, about the day's sort of climate, the temperature, the atmospheric pressure, cloud cover, and so on. I'm not a meteorologist, so I don't really know, but um, you know, can we predict if it's going to rain? And this is like a really, this is a billion dollar industry, you know, or not a billion dollars, that's probably an exaggeration, but, <laughs> but people are concerned with weather prediction, right? So, um, and, uh, and we'll, we'll see different examples of this. And um, another one is like spam. You, you know, you, everyone here probably has spam filters. You know, if you use Gmail, you certainly do, and most other email services. Spam filters are like, is this spam or is it not spam? And all we know is what are the words that appear in the email and maybe some other metadata. metadata. So can we figure out if something is spam from that data? Um, data? So that's, that's basically what's called supervised machine learning and um, and unsupervised machine learning is, is a little more amorphous, and, and we'll talk about, we'll end up talking a lot about, about those two in particular, supervised and unsupervised. Unsupervised is kind of the same thing, except there's no, nothing to predict exactly. There's no, um, you know, there's no continuous line or there's categories. We're interested in, like, understanding data or modeling it or maybe reducing it, it's, um, reducing it into something more manageable, you know, something that, like, a description almost, um, and that that's probably like that probably won't resonate so much right now because we have to see some specific examples of that. But we'll we'll do that really more or less starting tomorrow. Um, so that's machine learning, and um, I just have a couple more slides. So let's just mention like, um, and then I'm going to show a video clip, um, and which which I think people will like. So you say deep, also deep learning. Is that when it's starting to originate? The, that what was the question? When it's starting to originate things. Is that when it becomes deep learning? Deep learning basically means um, we'll see this tomorrow with neural networks more specifically, but it means that like um, machine learning algorithms that have sort of multiple and often many layers of transformations of data. Uh, typically, neural networks, not always neural networks, will be looking at it mostly in the context of neural networks. So it's neural networks, many layers. And we'll see that we'll see that more concretely tomorrow. Uh, okay, so there's so I would like I would just want to mention something about hype because this is kind of the interesting thing about machine learning. There's been uh, an incredible amount of um, in my lifetime an unprecedented amount of like interest in this field. Even a year ago, I would never have predicted that I'd be like, as a new media artist, like standing before, you know, 20 people talking about machine learning. It totally came out of nowhere um, because, and, and there has actually been, you know, I don't want to be hyping it more myself, but there actually has been this, um, there's been a number of facts that have emerged in the, in the news. I read an article um, just a few, I guess, months ago now, actually, um, that said that like um, attendance to machine learning introductory machine learning courses at universities has um, like skyrocketed by like something like six hundred percent. So it's like pretty. That's pretty amazing. There's been a ton of new investment. So that there's a lot of money being thrown around um, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Um, all of the tech titans, Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, Apple. You know, all of them have significant um, expenditures into machine learning technology, uh, and um, Google in particular is like, like they just had Google has an internal sort of conference every year called Google I/O, and um, their their uh, CEO basically talked about machine learning the whole time. So Google is really like positioning itself to basically be doing machine learning all the time, and there's been this sort of cascading effect. It's been you know, entering more of the creative domains. There's more journalists talking about it now. It's really sort of all over the place. And, and it's no wonder because we're starting to see now that so many of the things that we interact with on a daily basis 
uh, in, with our computers in particular are un underpinned by machine learning algorithms. So, you know, Facebook and Google, uh, pretty much anything that has images in it is using machine learning to organize them and to decide what's relevant to you uh, and, and to filter out content. And it's also used in things like, um, it, it's also hugely used in finance. So like um, transactions between, uh, by like investors and financial, financial types. I don't do that much finance, so we're not going to talk about that at all. But it is worth knowing that this is like a huge, huge industry. There's a lot of money in it. There's a lot of interest in it. And so people are just talking about it. And um, we're going to be rich. We're, gonna, we're not. We're not going to be rich. Um, that's not going to. Probably not going to happen. But uh, not. Not as long as we. I keep on doing this kind of stuff. This is not. I, I guarantee you, it's not. It's not lining my pockets quite as fast as I'd like it for it to. But. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a useful skill to know, and it, and it's uh, you know entering discussions all the time. And um, I also just want to say, and I, I, this is why the point of this slide is that the hype is not totally new. So this is, a, this is the New York Times in 1958, which is when neural networks first came to public attention. I just want to read this passage because I think it's amazing. So uh, the Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. So that's pretty, that's pretty incredible, I think, for 1958. New York Times, and uh, what happened was that like there was a ton of hype about machine learning, and a lot of people wanted to take advantage of that hype to create sort of new, interesting products and and promise a lot of things that like they didn't necessarily know they could fulfill, and so there was a ton of interest in machine learning in the uh, late 1950s and and into the 60s, and there was a lot of movies. That was the first big boom of like you know like science fiction and and movies talking about AI. And which we're going to actually look at in just a second. Um, and all of that kind of fell apart in the 1970s and 80s because there was all this over-promising and it's a really obscure field and no one could really tell apart fact from fiction. And when these promises failed to deliver, the whole thing just went into what's now called the AI winter, which was a period of very decreased investment and decreased interest in AI that persisted well into, like, basically into the 1990s and 2000s. And... Uh, and the part of the reason for that, I think, is because there's this big discrepancy in, in what people, you know, have access to, the information. It's really easy for people to kind of like, to, to, to you know, hype is very profitable, right? So um, you, can, you can deliver, you can promise a lot and then fail to deliver. And then that kind of is, ends up creating this bubble which bursts. And I think that could happen again, you know, and that's, that's part of the reason why I, I think that we should be striving to create more like um, you know more like um, that more people should know about this kind of stuff and be you know uh, a lot of people talk about programming as being like a new literacy which in some some cases I don't entirely agree with but there is some truth to that that like you know that we're interacting with these computers all the time and, and we, we should probably be uh, much more aware of, of like um, you know how what effect they have in us, and we should be able to be control them, and to be uh, to be able to understand, read in between the lines, and, and understand what is realistic, what's what's possible, what's not possible. Um, a lot of the doomsday movies, like Terminator, and you know, who knows, like The Matrix, and so on, they're really built upon um, this like big discrepancy in understanding between the public and and the experts, and so it's really easy to like, you know. Pr uh, say that like, okay, AI poses an existential threat because, you know, Terminator, right? And the truth is, like, nothing like that is ever going to happen, I promise. But we have, we have actually dangers that exist now, uh, and they're, they're really much more subtle. And we, we should try to understand them, and that's going to be kind of like what we do. Um, okay, so before... Oh, yeah, okay, so I have, I have one more. This quote, I, which I really like, and then I'll show you a video clip, and then we'll have lunch. Um, so I really, I really like this quote. This is from um, Edgar Dijkstra, who who's famous for Dijkstra's algorithm, which is what was it again? I think it's like the shortest point among a series. It's not the traveling salesman. It's 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 some optimization formula. I forgot exactly. Um, so the question of whether a computer can think is no more interesting than the question of whether a submarine can swim. So can anyone? Does anyone want to volunteer? Like, what what does he mean by that? You know, like, can anyone, I really like this quote, so, yeah? 
No, no. Um, anyways, submarine also, what we would do, call swimming is what the submarine is doing as a goal. And deep part is not the way that it's doing it, it is the same. Um, it's not really relevant if we can think of, or have decided the computer can think it's something we want. We want I use it as a tool to make something happen. And it's the end result that. Okay. Any other interpretation? It's like a question of semantics. It's just using words. It's like Victor Science language games. Mm -hmm. They're explaining this idea of maybe consciousness is actually just a thing of language. I mean, you know, they used to believe that vitality was the body because we couldn't explain how the organs worked. Maybe we can't explain how consciousness and the brain works because the science isn't there. And I think maybe there is something else but that's like a massive space in philosophy. But I think this whole idea of computer can think. The word thinking, and then submarine swimming, it's kind of mm -hmm. just words being used for these Maybe they are just constructs of mm -hmm. words. If in language, there's no such thing. Right, yeah, I, th I think he had something like that maybe in mind, uh, which is that, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a semantic question. So, like, um, you know, what is thinking? We don't really have, like, a, a proper definition for it. And a lot of times people really, like, assume that more or less thinking is what humans do. So it is, like, a, a thing that humans do. And therefore, if you define it that way, then no, computers cannot think. Uh, but, you know, is swimming, is the word... Is the word swimming to propel through water, or is the word swimming to do what humans do to propel through water, or ducks do, or whatever? And so it's kind of like, what are computer? Are computers doing the same thing? Are computers conscious, right? And things like people ask this question, and the truth is, there's like not necessarily an answer to that question. It just means it just the question is, what do you mean by conscious? Do we extend the notion of consciousness to that which computers are doing? It is some physical physical mechanism. It's got some some relevance in the real world, so is that consciousness? Well, I don't know. Um, so that's kind of like, I think, yeah, maybe a little bit about what he's getting to. It's such a huge question, though. Yeah. <laughs> problems, yeah, philosophers forever. Yeah. Where do you draw the line of consciousness? Does it require something more than science? Is it all computation in the brain? And if right. it is, then surely a computer could be conscious. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and along those same lines, can computers have goals or motivations or 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 tasks or you know what 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 are what are this what are their objectives? And uh, in order to arrive at that question, I want to reference a, a really great movie from the late 1960s that I'm going to show you a video clip of. Maybe some of you have seen it before. Um, that oh why why did I put this in? Did I forget that movie clip? Where is it? Hang on a second. Did I? I might have forgotten to put it in the slide deck, so I'll just I'll just play it. Yeah, this is already getting into. Unless I yeah okay, I forgot to put it in the slide deck, so I'm just gonna open. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, here it is. This is just uh, this is a two minute clip. So, um, how many of you guys have seen the Space Odyssey 2001? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Hey, although you took very thorough precautions <coughs> in the car against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. All right, Hal. I'll go in through the emergency airlock. Without your space helmet, Dave, we're going to find that rather difficult. Now I won't argue with you anymore. Open the doors. Hey, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye.
Oh, very ominous to end on, right? So that was 2001 Space Odyssey, one of the first movies to play on this, like, you know, the AI relationship with the human and, and, um, and playing on some people's fears, you know, like, like, will these things, you know, will these machines that we create, can they turn against us? Do they have their own objectives? Can they be controlled? And um, there is actually a lot of new research into this, and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it actually some, somewhat more through, um, through the course of this class. I just thought, uh, yeah? because we always think like computers are always dominant, uh, whether computers can lie as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's because in human beings, we look like people, right? Right. So we always predict, we always think like computers as the perfect honesty, they will always be honest, and even in the movie, that's kind of like, yeah, they tell them what will happen. It's very true, right? Mm -hmm. So on that ominous note, um, we can maybe we should break for lunch and uh, <laughs> and when we <laughs> and we'll, we'll uplift again, uh, you know, after lunch we'll talk about a whole bunch of like different artistic hacks that have happened with machine learning more recently, and um, maybe do like have some more discussion about what people's uh, backgrounds are, and then we can kind of help to plan the rest of the week. So um, yeah, okay, let's have some food. Well, so I can tell you where things are. Um, okay, so uh, the first thing I want to mention, I mentioned this earlier, is uh, Wekinator, and we're going to do a pretty uh, thorough introduction to Wekinator when the rec is here next week. And um, this is kind of it in a nutshell, what, what you're looking at in this video right here. That's me, <laughs> somehow, uh, and what I'm doing is... I'm using Face Tracker. A lot of you, a lot of you guys have used Face Tracker, right? Um, and it's transmitting the coordinates of my face to this program, Wekinator, over OSC. And Wekinator is learning a relationship between those coordinates and a bunch of synthesis parameters that I'm sending to Ableton Live. Um, raise your hand if you use Ableton Live. Okay, two, three people. Uh, four, five, maybe some people. Uh, you, are most people familiar with Ableton Live? You know, it's a music making environment. Um, so for a lot of uh, um, software which makes electronic music, the way we kind of think of it is like we have synthesizers and we have effects and all this kind of stuff and it all has parameters. You know, parameters like what is the, what is the, um, the BPM, like what is the tempo of this music we're making. And you can think of it as this number that we can control. And maybe you might want to make, a, you know, just as an example, you might want to make something that goes, okay, if my, if I'm making this kind of gesture with my face, like ah uh, or something, I don't know. <laughs> I should probably pause this because it's kind of silly. But um, if you're making a certain gesture with your face, maybe that'll make the music slow. And if you make a certain other kind of gesture with your face, it'll make the music fast. Or it might control a bunch of filters and things like that. You know, it's just a bunch of numbers, right? And um, if we want to create relationships like those, we might use machine learning to control this mapping. And tomorrow when we talk about neural networks, this is going to become a lot more concrete. You know, when I say things like mapping, um, that's probably not obvious what I mean by that. And so um, tomorrow we'll, we'll introduce this sort of more formally and we'll, we'll talk about what that means. But basically, Wekinator takes care of the, of the machine learning. It collects the data, it trains the model, and it does all of the communication between whatever applications you want to use. So like if you're using a lot of applications that can take parameters or if you're coding and processing or Max, things like that, um, you can make them interact with Wekinator. Um, and that's kind of like what we'll be using it for. And it looks like this. It's actually a really simple program, pretty easy to use. And um, we're gonna we're gonna do a lot with it. We'll bring in I'll bring in the connect. I know a few people have connects here, and we're gonna we're gonna do a lot of really cool things with it. So that will be sort of the first thing that we do. And I suspect a lot of people will want to try it out, use it, use it in projects, and so on. Um, so that's why. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, you can kind of like configure it in any way that you want, really. Um, any, any, yeah, there's all sorts of really creative ways that we can think to, to network these applications. Uh, so, yeah. Um, okay, so the other thing that I mentioned this earlier is Deep Dream. So, like, 
this is a this is an image. This is a picture I took. This is one of my favorite places in the world, and I I think I've shown it to you, to a few people here. But um, I won't talk about what it is. But the point is that Deep Dream is um, something that takes a photo and does this to it. <laughs> you can see the correspondence, right? So Deep Dream takes and what it does is it uses neural networks which analyze an image and look for objects in it. And, and objects that may not actually be there, but the, but the neural network kind of thinks are maybe sort of there. And then it will adjust the pixels to make those objects more apparent. And so if it starts to see these sort of cars or capsules or dogs or whatever, it will make them, it will, it will tease those things out of the image. And so if you saw this last year, there was a, for a whole month, you know, Deep Dream sort of overtook the, the, the social media sphere and lots of people were, because Google released their code for doing this and people started Deep Dreaming all these photos and pictures and paintings and things like that. And the internet was just awash in, in, in stuff that looked like this. Um, and I think I have, yeah, and you can also use Deep Dream to make trippy videos like this. It's like an infinite zoom of all sorts of weird, wild stuff. The source image for this is nothing but white noise. So it's just like random pixels. You feed it to Deep Dream, it finds things in it, and then you crop it and feed it again and Deep Dream it repeatedly and so on. And um, it may seem like super magical, but actually I think even this week we're going to describe at a high level how this works. Like you'll be able to understand wh what is ha happening inside this neural network to, um, to produce these images. And then in the week three, we'll, we'll kind of dive into it a little farther and, and hopefully implement it. Or not implement it, but use it. And, um, and some people might want to might wanna use that a little more. What did Google use to train? So the, uh, the ne neural network that they use is, is um, it's called like in Inceptionism. That's their like trained neural network that they use for image recognition and classification. Yeah, they put like Google Photos. Uh, it, I, I, I actually already forgot what it's trained on. I think it's trained on ImageNet, which is a huge database of images that are labeled. It seems like a lot of people dogs. Sorry? Yeah, there's a lot of dogs in there, yeah. <laughs> the, it probably is the case, yeah. And I have to remember, this is about a year ago. I forgot exactly some of the details. But that, that might be correct, yeah. Um, style transfer is another thing that we'll talk about, which, which, which is sort of like related and uses a similar technique but uses two images. So style, and this also happened roughly last year, around this time, maybe uh, in August, September. And it takes an image and it recomposes it in the style of another image autonomously. And it should be noted that like this maybe isn't super interesting in the sense that like, you know, anyone can, well, not anyone, but you can, you can think to paint the repaint the Mona Lisa in the style of Van Gogh, you know, a human expert painter could do that. But what's interesting about this is that for the first time ever, we see computer programs able to do it compellingly on their own and uh, able to do it with any arbitrary image. So you can give it any style image that you want and it'll repaint the Mona Lisa however. <coughs> and um, so that's kind of an interesting, interesting thing. I had a lot of fun with style transfer. I've been working with it. Um, and it's actually under constant development. So there's a lot of research into style transfer, not just for images, but also for sound and for text. Um, and we'll, we'll, again, we'll look more closely at it this week and maybe talk a little bit about how it works. And then week three will, I think, tentatively is, is when we'll do, explore it a little more in depth. Um, and we'll see lots of images like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, just somehow imagine a porn channel that's all like this kind of thing or something. Like, I wonder if there's one. What was that? It's just like, like porn videos, but they're all like... Oh, um, you know, there was like, I think someone did some like deep dreaming porn. <laughs> I don't remember, you know, like, yeah, I mean, you're gu guaranteed someone will do that. You know, like whenever there's a, yeah, whenever there's something that you can apply to images, someone will do it on porn. That's guaranteed. This is the internet. So... <laughs> It's that film, it's that film Loving Vincent that's just come out and it always seems kind of crazy they've done it now where they've actually got professional painting to paint every frame of this film about Vincent Van Gogh as a 
Vincent van Gogh. Oh, yeah, right, right. And he actually paints it all by hand. It yeah, kind of, right. And it does give it this wonderful, real quality, which I don't think this could quite get. Yeah. But maybe that's just in our heads, like, it's the fact that it was done by hand more than computers could just do this way. Yeah, and maybe the ones by hand actually look better. Uh, but again, like what we're really interested in isn't the pixels per se, you know, it's, it's really the process because style transfer as a process um, can be, you, can, you know, if we can demonstrate in the image domain, what other domains can be demonstrated in? And so far it's only been done compellingly, you know, on images, but um, you can imagine it being done in, and not just in other media, but in all sorts of data, you know, restyling data and style is a very abstract term. And it doesn't necessarily even have to have the same meaning that we, we attach to it in the, in the sort of visual domain. Uh, but yeah, style transfer is super interesting and an ongoing area of research. Um, that, those are the sort of deep learning things. Um, so I want to talk, I'll mention TSNI also, which is this really cool uh, technique that's really good for data visualization. And what TSNI is, is it's an algorithm which reduces the, which takes high dimensional data. And by high dimensional, I mean, you know, data which is described by as many things, you know, like let's say you have images, you can think of an image as a, as a, as a data point which has many pixels, that's your data, right? And if we can take that information and compact it into two dimensions, uh, we can then do it for things like visualizing in 2D. So again, like this is, I'm describing it at a very high level. We will actually look at this, I hope next week. And actually I've been thinking about maybe making TSNI the sort of like final part to this week because it's actually pretty simple to implement. And I'm going to think about maybe like one of the practical sessions that we'll do this week is to generate these. And, um, and let me just show you because we haven't actually zoomed in on these images. So this takes a data set of images, this particular TSNI, takes a bunch of images of animals in the data set called Caltech 256 and it's able to autonomously organize them in 2D so that images that are similar to each other not in terms of their you know color or or like superficial characteristics like that but actually in content so you see that like you know the whales are sort of grouped dolphins and whales are grouped together and plants and cacti and bonsai trees are up here near each other. These are like bugs, scorpions, uh, you know, and this is the really ugly part of this TCP. Let's go to the more pretty. Uh, or clams or whatever, or um, crabs. Where's the really, there's like dogs here and cats. Uh, let's go down here. Yeah, yeah, cats. We have to find the cats. Actually, the cats might not be in here. It's like the same as Google. Sorry? Uh, Google's visually similar images? Uh, well, it's probably, so not exactly. Uh, I mean, they're related because they're both probably using a convolutional neural network, which again, we'll describe later this week. Um, but um, here, uh, yeah, again, I can't go into too much depth yet because it won't make sense without a lead up about neural networks, which we'll talk about tomorrow. I'm actually going to reintroduce this tomorrow, basically. But the point is that we can actually autonomously organize data points by content-based similarity. So here are all of these, you know, I don't know, owls, oh, there's an owl section here, chimpanzees and so on. And TSNI is a generic technique. It's not just on um, images, but you can apply it to, for example, text. Oh, did I, I didn't even have that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see that tomorrow. So TSNI can be applied to text and also to sound, and I'll, I'm going to show you some demos of that. Um, so, okay, I'm going to show you some works from Alt-AI. So Alt-AI, and, and you might mention it, she was there. Um, was anyone else there? So, um, so this was a, a conference that I helped organize with a screen reporter, Kanda Kikin, who can be said to be the, the sort of predecessor to this school. Is that, is that fair to say? <laughs> um, and um, good friends of mine who created the schools in New York, very similar to School of Ma. I really encourage you guys to check out their programs. It's, it's, uh, they have kind of like, in fact, there's an open call right now for a two-week session in, um, uh, in August, I think.
and then there will be one in the, in the, in the fall, I think, uh, a longer one. So very similar to this, and, and ex except it's structured more as like you have multiple teachers who kind of come in on different days and you really learn different things. Uh, and it's, uh, we organized this conference about machine learning and art. And um, we had a bunch of speakers and workshops and the big ex exhibition that I helped to carry. And, we, and I had never carried it actually, so that was like a weird thing for me. I'm not sure that I ever will, I guess. <laughs> but um, this is some highlights here. I'm going to show some of the works from the exhibition. And actually, the, um, what happened to the, uh oh, uh, the, the frame. Yeah. Um, this is what happens when you write your own presentation software a lot. Uh, yeah, it's frozen, I think. That's okay. Uh, let's do that again. And here's, I have this other trick where I can... Slideshow.set page. Okay. And, uh, and here, actually, while it's loading, this is the website for it, altai.net. Um, we've had all these speakers. You might probably recognize some of them. Um, Open the pod bay doors, Hal. Um, then we're going to show some works by them. We had workshops, and here's the big exhibition sort of that we carry. I'm gonna, and a lot of the works that I'm showing are going to be from here. Um, Deep Dream style transfer. t -Sni. There we go. Okay. So this one's made by uh, Jason Levine, who's um, a musician and a coder, and he does a lot of live coding stuff. And he took that Tisney idea, so we just talked about Tisney, and he arranged a whole bunch of audio samples in 2D so that similar sounding samples are next to next to each other. And then he does live coding, which is this sort of like um, like basically making audio while coding it live. And he designed this program, which lets him kind of do these trajectories through the audio samples and playing them. So it kind of looks like this. He did this performance uh, on the first night of all time. This is on the performances. The performances are also online, actually. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. You have to ask him. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I have some audio samples that I found on, um, I, can't, I have to whisper this in Germany, Torrents. <laughs> um, but, uh, and yeah, you can buy sample packs and so on. Um, you know, like, I think a lot of different, like, software people use to make music, like Reactor or whatever, comes with a lot of samples. I don't do that much music stuff, so I'm not positive. Yeah, um... Similar, uh, but but it's not actually like nearest neighbors usually refers to like finding some the nearest neighbors to some single object. But this is Tisni, um, and again we'll talk about Tisni more carefully tomorrow, uh, or maybe not. No, well, we'll see. Uh, Tisni is not totally you know, neural network stuff, but we use it in tandem with neural networks. Anyhow, um, that's that's Jason's. This is um, an installation that was made by Cassie Takarajian. Um, oh, I think it's Cassie Tarakajian. I pronounce it. Uh, but um, this is actually like visualizing a convolutional neural network in virtual reality. So this is like the great like AI plus VR mashup. And you see that some, uh, this is actually Lisa, she's inside the Oculus Rift, and she can see her hand, you can see the TV in front of her, right? Um, and that's her hand, like, touching these numbers, and she, you can draw a number in space, and then it will tell you, and it will use a convolutional neural network to tell you what number that is. And so it's kind of like, because convolutional neural networks are these sort of difficult to understand things, and so... Uh, we can understand them using like visuals and, and, and create an environment in sort of virtual reality that lets you see what's going on inside of them. And that was something that, that Cassie made for, uh, for Alt AI. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a new work by um, Golan Levin, David Newberry, and Kyle McDonald. Uh, some of you guys probably know the names. Terra Pattern is the name of the work. And it's basically like satellite images reverse search. 
Um, and it's kind of similar a little bit to, it's like what we just looked at with Tisney. You know, you were talking about nearest neighbors a little bit. So there's a, you know, if we, we can use convolutional neural networks to understand the content of images, and then we can use that as a, as a sort of feature vector that, that is associated with every image. And then uh, you can do things like this. So in this project, and actually I can go to the website. Um, let's look at Terra Pattern. Uh, Terra Pattern dot org. Oops. Oops. Uh, um, so, so like for oh, do we have, oh we have Berlin. Oh look, let's, look, let's try this out. Okay. <laughs> so the way this works is um, okay. So like this is the satellite, and I'm gonna satellite imagery, and I'm gonna click this tile, and it's going to find other parts of Berlin satellite imagery that looks similar to it. So I click on this tile, and here it finds all these other places. Maybe this isn't the best example. Yeah, that one didn't work so well. So let's let's actually let's look for some more places. Uh, what's a like? What's a really sort of unique looking thing in Berlin? Can you see it from satellite imagery? What is this? Oh, it's a stadium. Let's see if we can find the... How about this? I search for a part of a stadium, and it finds this kind of looking stuff. Um, I know this better in New York, I think, but... Uh, it's good to look off of... Golan says that you should look like off the coasts of things and look for like ships and things like that. I don't know Berlin geography well enough to know where I can find that, so... <laughs> Uh, how about zoom in on here? So basically it's like, it's a way of finding, yeah, let's see if we can find the boats. Here's a boat, bar barges. Hmm. So yeah, anyway, um, terror pattern is, is that they, and the uh, Golden Co, they actually, they, they viewed it actually at, um, at Alt-AI and now it's, I think it's in a bunch of cities and um, yeah, it's like reverse image search by satellite imagery and it helps you find things that aren't necessarily labeled inside of satellite images. So neat project um, of theirs. And again, we'll, we will have the tool, we'll be learning the kinds of tools that would help you make something like this. Uh, and it's, it's much less complicated than it seems once you understand convolutional neural networks. <laughs> and that's kind of the punchline of this week. Uh, actually, and these are this is a good example. So, like here, they're searching for golf courses, right? Here are bus depots, tennis courts. So, like you zoom in on a tennis court, select a tennis court, and it'll find you more tennis courts, um, which may not necessarily be labeled in satellite imagery. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, if you want to find unique things, uh, you could you could say yeah. Um, uh, this was a project by Hannah Davis, who also gave a talk um, at Altai, and basically is creating music from the text of books of novels. So, and, it, and I think actually it's using more like natural language processing techniques rather than neural networks. But you can uh, do this like you can have a computer analyze the, a novel, like narrative of a novel, and then turn that into uh, music using MIDI, where it analyzes the sentiment of the novel. So like sad parts or really phonetic parts or like, you know, maybe mysterious. You can see, you know, anticipation, joy, disgust, sadness kinds of emotional qualities that, that she's parsing in the novel and then turning that into corresponding music. So what you're listening to is Lord of the Flies turned into music. Yeah, I 
I think she's using like sentiment analysis tools, which is like uh, something that you could do in natural language processing, where you can analyze entire paragraphs or pages. I might be wrong about that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no necessarily a correct way to do this, so it's, yeah, but it, it is food for thought. You know, like, can we go between different kinds of media and use some sort of an intermediary you know, language? That's so interesting. This is the whole I think it's the whole book, yeah. I believe it's the whole book. And uh, yeah, this is like, it's longer. We're just listening to us. It's not well enough to describe at length, yeah. Um, but but she has a website, it's musicfromtext.com, where I think you can read a little more in depth about how she's doing that. Um, so that's a cool project. This one's sort of, this one's uh, made by a good friend of mine named Philip Stearns, and maybe some of you guys know the name. Uh, he's uh, pretty active in like, um, he's sort of hyperactive, he does lots of stuff in like, I think mostly well known for like, a, doing a lot of stuff with um, circuit bending and, and uh, like creating electronics and so on that make, uh, that make things. Uh, these days he's doing a lot more digital stuff, but in any case he made this like 10 years ago. It's an it's, it's a analog neural network. So this is a neural network in, in circuits. And um, actually it's not on in this, in this video, so I should probably find the video where, where it sees it in action, but it's actually modeling you know, the way we think of a, a neural network in, in circuits. And we had this sort of hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it's a really, really cool piece by Phil. Um, Doppelcam. This one's really cool. So, um, and it's made by Melanie and Drew. They also had it at Alt AI. So you take a picture and it searches, I think, uh, a Russian image repository maybe like Yandex's, uh, I forgot the exact source, but it looks for visually similar images. Uh, could be from the 70s, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, and actually, they have this online, so let's actually look at it. Um, Doppelcam. Yeah, so like if I, um, I'll just, I'll just okay, I'm going to take a photo. And now it's searching for the most similar image. I hope. <laughs> Seems to be taking its time. Um, Let's check the JavaScript. Oh, there we go. There it is. Okay, so this guy. <laughs> and now maybe, maybe. Um, okay, actually, now let's let's. Well, I won't break my promise and put you guys in, inside the inside the photo. <laughs> How about maybe if I put my. I think it's searching like a. Uh, I think it's searching Yandex or something. I, I forgot exactly. It's like the uh, Russian image, like database. Yeah, right. Um, and yeah, this is the kind of thing that we'll learn exactly how it works. I I suspect it's using convolutional neural networks. Let's see if it, fi it finds like maybe another phone. So I'll put my phone in front of it. Uh, let's find out. Yeah, I guess we'll see. Yeah. Let's see what it comes up with as it's double canning. <laughs> I take a screenshot. I seem to remember it being a little faster than this, but it's searching through lots and lots of images, so I suppose it's not guaranteed to be. Well, that's the thing. Like it, these kinds of algorithms should be kind of resistant to things that like are inconsequential, like like um, reflections. So it's looking for content. 
So maybe if it recognizes there's a phone, I'll be curious to see if it finds another iPhone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's taking a little while. Hey, baby. <laughs> someone, I guess, uh, I guess someone forgot to uh, maybe that's some debug uh, JavaScript code, and uh, kind of ended up there. All right, come on. All right, while it's while it's searching, we'll come back to it. I'm going to go to the next project. Um, this was made by actually a student of mine in the in the machine learning uh, at ITP course called uh, named uh, Chino Kim. And what these are. So you know what beta blockers are? They're like sunglasses that, uh, like, I guess, um, like they are clouded. You can like turn off your own vision, basically. And he has a camera mounted to his head, and it's using again, it's using a convolutional neural network to try to detect screens. So whenever you look at a computer screen or like your phone or a TV, the glasses fog, so you can't see. So it basically prevents you from looking at screens. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how Doppel Cam is doing. Oh man, not so well, huh? Alright, we'll see if it comes back. we'll see if it uh, ends up with anything in the in the meanwhile. Uh, this was a, a work by Marcelo Nowak and actually this is a really bad image of it. it this is we printed this. So it's um, a mosaic of Instagram photos. All of these are searched through Instagram and then it uh, arranges them so that it's it, uh, you know what a mosaic is, like it's one of, you know, like you can see these a lot in, I don't know, like souvenir shops. It's like a big image made out of smaller images. So there's a big picture of these like hot air balloons and a whole bunch of Instagram photos that get tiled into it. Uh, and this is a, not a, such a great photo of it, but if you look, like if we had the bigger thing, you could look into it and all of those pictures are small images of other things. Um, this is made by, and I mentioned uh, a friend of mine, Lisa, and this is also, I just have poor, poor documentation, but she used style transfer to sort of help her, um, like, be, she, like, is exploring this idea of, it, like, becoming a better, better painter by using, by having AI kind of, uh, like, analyze her style and um, help her to learn other kinds of styles. So she made, like, this grid where she did a, a bunch of different paintings that look like this, and then she made another series of paintings of like more abstract ones, and then restyled the uh, painting, the paintings that she, the first set of paintings that she made, with the second set, and made this whole sort of grid, different styles of the same. You know, so you can kind of multiply your your output in this sort of way. Um, and she wrote, she actually wrote a an article about it that got featured in like Google's uh, Medium blog. So you can look, look at that, AMI, it's like um, Art with Machine Intelligence uh, on Medium. This is a cool project. This was made by um, two students of mine at ITP. And what it is, it's a piano that's been dismembered. And the piano is watching the movie Die Hard with Bruce Willis. And every time it sees an explosion, it plays itself. And I wish I had video of it. I don't have video on, on my computer. Um, we have it coming in some Alt-AI hi highlights. But it basically, it's got this like mechanical arm that's playing the strings of the piano. And every time there's explosions in, in the TV screen, it starts to play. <laughs> and it's using a neural network to detect those explosions. Um, and we'll see a lot, of these, um, a lot of these installations, like this one, for example, all, the last three that we looked at, uh, actually, th this one, so the one with the piano, piano die hard, um, the beta blockers, um, and actually the next one, which I'll show you, uh, I'll, I'll describe this one. All of them are special cases of a generic technique that we're going to learn how to do, which is how to train your own image classifier. So to train a neural network to discriminate amongst different kinds of images. And when it does that, you can attach different kinds of actions to those uh, classifications. So in this project, this was made by Seth Kranzler, also at ICP. He has a camera that, let, that tells you whether the thing you're holding is recyclable or not. So like you put a bottle in front of it and it's like, you can recycle this. 
you put you know trash in front of it and it goes this is not recyclable and you're and he was able to and we're going to show exactly how to do this so you can make your own image classifier so something that takes any kind of image image and categorizes it into a custom set of categories that you choose so in this case it's in this case it's um, recyclable or non-recyclable in this case it's explosions or non-explosions um, in this case it's uh, uh, screens or non-screens and uh, and so you can think of like all sorts of permutations of this uh, that you can incorporate and I suspect that this this could be a, a big class of uh, projects for this class as well um, this is a project project that I actually worked on this is with some some friends of mine in New York and it's using some some software that I built that does gesture recognition so we trained it to recognize different kinds of gestures so it's able to classify it's able to detect different kinds of gestures and then again attach that to actions and in this project what we did uh, was it was called body language and uh, the main artist is Nancy Novichuk who was a fellow at IBM when I was a resident there and what it's doing is um, you, it, it's hooked up to an, a, uh, a program that's writing Arduino code and all the different gestures are mapped to different uh, code statements so it's writing code, you're writing code with your body so you go like, okay, I want to make a for loop and you do a certain set of gestures to write it and so it's exploring this notion of like writing code in different ways so maybe like you can create a correspondence between choreography and code writing and this has been a, actually, a, uh, I think, um, in the last year or two, I've seen lots of works exploring this kind of more, um, like more broadly. There are lots of projects that are trying to make correspondences between coding and choreography, um, and I participated actually in some of it. Um, so you can see that it's like, you know, it's sending all this to. We don't have, I don't have this in the video, but it's sending it to an Arduino, and then and then she she danced the script that made the Arduino blinky like. Um, so that was um, that was that project. This was made by Marcel Schwitlik, who's, who's now my roommate here. <laughs> um, and um, and this is actually like applying style transfer to a collaborative painting. So it's doing iterations that are then like I think maybe fast forward a little bit so you'll see later the thing goes through these iterations and people draw over it and then it applies more style transfer to it and they made a video piece um, out of it. Um, this was made by Mike Taika, and we talked about Deep Dream. Mike Taika is one of the um, original authors of the Deep Dream. Like uh, he, he did a lot of the initial art experiments with Deep Dream. Again, we'll talk about that more tomorrow. Um, but making just like this is actually the it's a little misshapen, but you see what's going on here. It's like this is a neural network producing these images, and they look like sort of birds and you know different kinds of. Uh, different kinds of creatures that Google's image searches are trained to recognize. And uh, it's pretty pretty neat, I'd say. Did you essentially do it like you had it trained on one thing and then another thing No, actually. Uh, it's it's a little different. Um, there's no more there's no like image like um, fading happening. It's actually every frame is generated by a neural network, which parameterized in a certain way. This will again, this will like these are all just meant to be eye candy right now, and, and tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about what's actually going on um, inside of them, and then again more deeply, uh, more deeply in week three. Um, let's see how Doppelkamp is doing. Um, oh, I guess I guess it timed out on us maybe. Oh, was it? Okay, well that's Doppelkin. Um, we'll, <laughs> we'll go on. So um, this is Cubist Mirror. I made this, and actually this is my mom. <laughs> it's her birthday today. Actually, I gotta gotta call her an hour or two. Um, so and I'll show you. I actually I can show you Cubist Mirror. So what's going on here is it's doing style transfer in real time, and it's inside of a like just a dismembered LCD screen, and it's. It's turning you into a cubist painting. So it's a mirror which turns you into, into a cubist painting. Um, and actually, I can maybe. I wonder if this will be. I'll save this for tomorrow. I'll show, I'll show the actual cubist mirror. Uh, 
in software, but this is kind of what's happening. It's a neat, neat project. Um, yeah, I've done a bunch of, bunch of different experiments with stock transfer. Uh, moving, okay, so now this is not, um, not no longer Alt-AI stuff. This is just some other works that I've kind of collected throughout the year. Um, and a lot of this stuff is not, this is not exhaustive. There's lots more. And I've probably forgotten lots of things, and I'll try to bring them into class as I remember them. Well, this is a project uh, made by um, Eric Bernardson, where he, he took 50, he found a data set of fonts, uh, 50,000 different font sets, and he um, like created, had a neural network analyze them so that it could produce new fonts. And you're able to parameterize these. These are all like imagined fonts that it's kind of like uh, parameterizing and, and kind of coasting this generative space that the neural network produced. Um, again, that's very hand wavy, but I think... Uh, That'll be more clear when we when we talk about generative models and and neural networks, and you can see that there's all these different fonts that you could produce with it, and none of them are actually in existence. Or, or Is he uh, I don't know if he sold them. I don't I don't know if that happened, but uh, who knows? Maybe. <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. I mean that these things could be functional and not just art. Well, what's, what typically happens is like artists will demonstrate something for free or for fun, and then capitalists will sell, will sell it later. Well, that's the thing. I think there shouldn't be two separate camps, and also the artists figure out ways. I mean, ideally, some of you will figure out ways to monetize what you're doing, and it's not like a bad thing. I mean, it's not like, capitalists, ah! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, all of that is great in theory. I hope, uh, I hope you're, that that is something that comes out of this. So far, that's not the, the typical model. It's time for a change, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... It's not the dark side, it's like pay your rent and you Yeah, It's like that whole neoliberal arts movement where people like sort of making fun and stuff. Sort of that people the... Um, the the doll tech, you seen that? I'm not familiar with that. That's great. I've seen that. Doll, but yeah, the doll tech is really funny. It's like this, yeah, whole idea of making a artwork as a startup, and the startup became the artwork, and the artwork became the startup, and it was kind of really weird, and I've got twisted that actually did get a quick one this one. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not familiar with that. Um, I got a couple more of these. So this was made by uh, Robin Sloan, who's a uh, he wrote a novel um, called Mr. Penumbra's, uh, I forgot the exact name. Yes, that, that one, yes, Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookstore, right? Have you, have you read it? I have no idea what it is, actually. I just remember it. Not well, in any case, he's like a best-selling author, and, and he got really into neural networks. So that's, so that's, and, he, um, and he produced this, and it's basically... We're going to talk about recurrent neural networks later in this class, which um, if you, you've probably seen some of this, so like neural networks producing text, so they can kind of like, you can feed it, I'm going to show this tomorrow actually, but you can feed neural networks like a whole ton of text, and it will learn how to compose new text in the style of that text. So like you can make um, neural networks spit out fake Shakespeare. You know, that's that, like text that looks like Shakespeare wrote it, but isn't, doesn't make any sense at all, actually, if you read it for long enough. And what he did is he applied it to uh, making a text editor that lets you write science fiction and gives you suggestions. So here you can see he's typing, and then he goes, uh, I want a suggestion, and the neural network gives it a, so go, take us home. Well, let's see, yeah, the computer said, give me a suggestion. Keep out of the way, Jenny. <laughs> so you see what's going on? Yeah, give me a suggestion. <laughs> so it's like this sort of collaborative writing with a neural network. And, the, and this kind of... So it's lots of fun things like this. And we'll see some... Of, we'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow, actually. Um, you can do the same thing to make... To autonomous Twitter accounts. So this is Deep Drumpf. This is a Twitter account that type that, that writes messages 
in the style of Donald Trump? <laughs> Usually when I present this, I just I can't even say it. I feel like I need to let people read it. You know, I can't I can't get the, the Trump accent right. <laughs> Um, oh, this is out of order. Um, this should probably have come after Robin's own thing. So this is a, a student at ITP named Ross Goodwin did something very similar to what I showed with Robin Sloan's, but he actually had a, an online interface that lets you do it um, online. And actually, I tried it out yesterday, and I, th I think he, I think it's broken right now, or I think because it has a back-end service that he might have just shut off because it costs money. Um, but um, in any case, that's, that's online. That's the, it's called WordSync. Uh, this is something I, I just put online a few days ago. Let me just describe this real quick. So you can use neural networks to caption, to, to look at an image and tell you what's in it, to caption it. So like it looks at this picture and it goes, there's a black bag on the chair. And these captions are, are they're written by the neural network. So you feed this neural network thousands of images that have millions of captions that human beings have attached to them. And it learns a correspondence between images and, and captions. And so then you can give it new images, and it can caption parts of it. So it's, as you can see, it's not absolutely the most accurate thing in the world. But these things are, these systems are, I think, you know, even a couple of years ago, were totally unknown. And they're getting better all the time. Um, and so I applied this to... This is, an, this is the video that came out earlier this year from a company called Boston Dynamics. They made a, uh, they have the, they make these um, robots, these like autonomous moving robots that are really good at navigating rough terrains. And this is basically next generation warfare actually, to be quite honest, and we, we don't have to talk about that too much, but they make these incredible robots. And this was the highlight video they created of it. And I took it and I fed it through these captioning systems. So now it's captioning the the um, the video, and you can see it's kind of it's kind of humorous. So it's like, so here the robot walks along and it goes, well, white and blue motorcycle. It called it, yeah. So it thinks that's a motorcycle. There's a window in the room, a glass window, a sign on the pole, a large tree with snow, a person on skis, <laughs> and and the. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that needs to be said about this, and when we talk about recurrent neural networks, we'll talk about this a little bit more. I know you're pr I'm probably sounding like a broken record, like, we'll talk about this later, we'll talk about this later, but um, but it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of hard to say very much about how this works until we until we look at neural networks more generally. Person on the bike, person on the snowboard. Why does it always think it's passing? It's got four minutes. I suppose, uh, it's, yeah, because <laughs> it looks like a person to the neural network. There's a part in this video where, like, the operator starts to mess with the robot a little bit. So he, like, comes with a, maybe, so have you, some, some of you have seen this maybe before? Um, yeah, he just, like, look, he's just, like, totally... Just messing with the robot. <laughs> That's the thing. These robots are very benevolent right now. It's actually it's us discriminating against the robots. In fact, I dare you to not sympathize with the robot right now. Do you feel empathy? You see, you do. Yeah. I think uh, this can become an issue in a few generations. Who knows? Maybe we're going to be asking for... And actually, I'll, I'll talk about this in something I'll... One of the issues that I want to talk about is like machine rights. Um, that's something that we'll we'll talk about in the near future. Uh, <laughs> I also I did this with Deep Dream videos, so you see it sees lots of dogs. It's like dogs, dogs, head of a dog. <laughs> yeah, so. This is, this is cool because this is like a neural network dueling with another neural network. Because the neural network produces an images, images, and then another neural network comes and tries to describe what those images are. So it's pretty... Yeah, right? Isn't it? 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a project done by this fellow named David Ha, who um, trained a recurrent neural network. We'll talk about what, what that means. Recurrent neural networks are basically neural networks that can create sequences of, of, of data. So text, for example, we were looking at a lot of text examples, but those sequences can be anything. And he taught it, he gave it a data set of, of, of Chinese characters, and he taught it to create new Chinese characters. So none of these, I don't know if anyone here can read Chinese, but um, if you can, you'll, you'll see that none of these make any sense. <laughs> these are all fake Chinese characters that a neural network autonomously made after learning what Chinese characters look like. Um, so that's a, that's a neat little project. Um, okay, and that's, that's kind of the end um, of the showcase. We, that was a ton of, um, there was a ton of different examples. We'll, we'll be looking at more as we go. And you can see that the field is very broad and there's lots of like, lots of different hacks that you can see. Um, later when we start to explore some of the methods that were used in making these, I'll uh, revisit some of these works and you'll see that like a lot of them are actually related. They, they may look like very different from each other, like neural recycle and beta blockers. You know, the recycling, uh, the, the robot, the not a robot, but the, the classifier that tells you whether something is recyclable or not. And the beta blockers are actually basically using the same underlying technology. And when we look at, when we see what those things are, you'll see that it's kind of a wellspring for many different applications some of which you may care about more than others. So that's kind of something to look out for when we learn a little bit more fundamentally, like what's going on. Um, okay, so that's the showcase. So now um, maybe we should, uh, should we talk about, you know, doing this, uh, like should we do our round table and maybe have a discussion about what people's, is it, is it too early still? Can you do like a tiny break or oh yeah, we can do a little break and then, and do that, and then maybe the trolley problem thing I'll save for tomorrow because, as you can see, I'm not actually ready. To <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this like a question about ethics, um, and and then it precedes machine learning, but it's kind of relevant. Um, so why don't we take a break, and then we'll we'll have a little roundtable, and I'm going to turn the recording off. Mm -hmm.